The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. And, and we all know that we've used Windows long enough, it tends to get sluggish, it tends to pretty much, you know, get to a point where it's almost unusable. And if you're using certain version Windows, it'll just start working completely, completely until you reinstall Windows. And so those were my main reasons for switching. All right, you know, I've, I've tried a variety of different Linuxes. I mean, I've, I mean, I've actually tried to transition to all Linux environment for like about five or six times before I finally got it right. And, you know, part one of the reasons was that Linux was still, for the desktop was still maturing. I mean, there was so many, back when I started using Linux, I mean, it didn't support a lot of the hardware that it does now. I mean, you had all these different, you know, win, like Win modems, like has had a parent that didn't work in Linux, had my, had an internal DSL modem. I don't know why I went that route, but it was my internal modem. I was on DSL at the time when I first started using Linux, and it would not work. And so, and so, so because of those different reasons, and not to mention the fact that a lot of the open source software at the time wasn't as mature, I ended up having to go back to Windows. And so, so I used Red Hat mainly while I was at Mercer, which was 2002 to 2004. I tried Win Linux, and if anybody remember Win Linux, it basically allowed you to install Linux from within Windows. But what made Win Linux unique was it ran on a FAT32 partition, which was something that was unheard of, and that's something that's like really not recommended because no, you can't really secure FAT32. And so one time I tried to uninstall Linux and pretty much it just, now I, I, I couldn't boot anything. <laughs> then I tried Mandrake, but it was, it was a good you know, distro, but at the same time, it had some limitations at the time. I, I tried Debian, I like Debian for the most part, but you know, but for me, Debian, I had Debian as one of my servers, my small servers that I was testing Linux in a server environment, and I liked it, but you know, but I find Debian to be a little bit too complex. Now, I mean, back in that, back in when I started using Debian, but I mean, now I can probably use it, but at the time I found it was so confusing. I used Fedora. I mean, I like Fedora. The only gripe I have about Fedora was it didn't, it, it was hard to make proprietary codecs work. And so I ended up leaving Fedora. Ubuntu, I'm actually using Ubuntu right now on things like three or four of my machines. I mean, I love using Ubuntu. I also tried Kubuntu, before, I tried Kubuntu first, but one thing I've noticed about Kubuntu is like, a lot of the KDE didn't necessarily match up with what was going on with the config files. I mean, I, I mean that was last year. I, I don't know if that's been improved or not, but for me, Kubuntu, I mean, even though I like the KDE interface, I just find that you know, for certain tasks, like for like wireless internet, it kind of did, did some strange things where sometimes I could connect and sometimes I couldn't. But that's just my experience. I mean, some, probably, I mean, probably your experience is probably, probably different. And recently, I started using Linux Mint on my one of my laptops, and I mean, I really enjoy using that distro. I mean, I find it to be even even simpler than Ubuntu. But for it's like my server at home, I'm using Ubuntu, which I'll talk about a little later. All right. 
when we install in Windows, like if you, like if you don't, and not, we're not talking about you, my computer that has Windows pre-installed, we're talking about if you just want to install Windows from scratch, you buy it from the store, you only got like certain programs. Like you got a few games and stuff, but you don't have any, you don't have your office suite, don't have your stuff that you need to really get stuff done. Whereas with Linux, the Linux comes, you know, you have different distros, and different distros have all the software that you need based on what you want to use Linux for. And we, know, we all know with Windows, you have a lot of security issues. You know, like you're always having like patches, and one of the things about Microsoft is they don't always update the security vulnerabilities in a timely manner. Now they know it's like one that was they waited like a year before they actually patched it up. But I mean, and with Windows, you have to have to run your antivirus, your anti-spyware, you know. I mean, any other like anti-malware programs, you have to run down Windows. Well, Linux is pretty much secure from from the setup, from the get-go. I mean, you can run antivirus on Linux if you want to, you know, like if you are using Windows files, you're sharing Windows files with another user and you don't want them, you don't want to inadvertently send that virus through your machine, even though, even though your virus, the virus won't affect your machine, it could affect your, your friend's machines if they're still using Windows. And my third point between Windows and Linux is Windows, you have to go to all different places like if you want your antivirus, you gotta go to this vendor. Right? If you want your Office Suite, you go to Microsoft, you gotta use their disk. I mean, different software, you have to, to go to different places. Whereas Linux uses a repository. And I find that unique because, find it neat because all you have to do is just you know, type in a few commands or go to your package manager, select what you want, install for the internet. It makes it so much simpler to install and uninstall. And of course, you know, when, when you uninstall a program from Linux, it, it, it really does a good job of cleaning stuff up. Whereas with Windows, you have a lot of junk left behind. All right, any questions so far? And of course, you no know, programs like all comes down to like different philosophy. Windows programs, for the most part, you're gonna pay for them, although there are some freeware alternatives. With Linux, most things, most everything is like free as in beer, is for except for a very few, except for some few exceptions. And of course, like I said before, you have to go to different different places to get your software. Some software you have to install from CD, some from the internet. Whereas with Linux, you just go one, one place and just update. And one thing about Windows software is that you have one package and it's not try to do it as much as possible. Whereas with Linux, you have is focused on just doing one task task well. So you don't have to worry about you no know, having to jack with all trades and not an expert or nothing. Like your Linux software is designed to do one particular task well. And so I'm going to talk about you know, some of my workstations that I have at home. Now, this is my desktop that I purchased last year. This one run, run Ubuntu Lucid Lens, you no know, 10.04. It has a AMD Athlon dual core processor, 220 gig hard drive, and three gigabytes of RAM. And on this machine, it came preloaded with Windows 7. However, when I, how I wipe Windows 7 off that machine, so I guess you can guess how many times I run Windows 7 on that particular machine. <laughs> but, but really, I bought this machine mainly to test Linux. I mean, I had a desktop at the time that was running Windows, and I didn't want to touch it at, at that particular moment. And so with that, and so with this machine, I basically you know, installed Ubuntu, I did some tweaking, and I spent 
like several months working on this machine. And while I was working on this machine, I noticed I wasn't even touching my Windows machine. I mean, I mean, all my hardware work, my print had like two, have a inkjet printer, laser printer that worked all the time. I mean, pretty much I, I just hook up my peripherals and it just works. Whereas with Windows, you have to, yeah, you have to have your driver's CD, you have to install your drivers, and some of your driver's CDs come with all this extra software that you have to install in order to get the thing to work. And I mean, I mean, who wants to have all this extra software? Just if you want to install a printer, you just need the drivers, right? You don't need to have like this suite that comes with, with this printer. You don't, you don't need to have the software to like print pictures because you probably already got your software to print pictures already, right? I mean, same thing, you know, with like setting it, like if you install a wireless card, you don't need to install all this extra software if you just want to get your wireless card to work. Just use the software that comes with the operating system. And so pretty much this machine I just use to my, my main office system, use my internet, email, you know. I also do watch some movies on this machine because it, it can handle it. And one thing to notice about Linux is I have three gigs around, but it's hard using over one, one gig. And so I got like two gigs around not being used. Whereas if I was running Windows, it will probably be using all the RAM and then be using all that swap space and that would slow down the system. But with Linux, everything, everything's just pretty much, pretty much responsive. And, and this machine, I have not had to do a reinstall of Ubuntu Matter of fact, this machine runs just as well as it did when I started a year ago. And I, I think I installed it a year ago, Monday. So, so we can see how Linux is so much reliable. All right. Now here's my next talk, this is my favorite because this is actually hooked up to my TV. And so while I was in my apartment, I actually had a wire run from my, from my wireless router to the net talk because it was, because they were so close. Like I had my living room, my office PC in the same, same area. Whereas in my house, they're in a separate place, so hence I have to have a you know, wireless card. I could have run wired, but I didn't feel like doing it at, at the time. Although I may do that in, in the future. But pretty much, you know, it's, you have a Intel Atom processor, have 106 gig of hard drive space, and it originally came with one gig of RAM. I was able to upgrade to two gigs, even though the text, the tech manual says on the maximum amount you can put in, in this machine was one gig. But you know, so that tells you that sometimes you can't trust your tech manuals, and so. This machine also running a bunch of Lucid Lints. And my favorite software around this machine is Boxy. Now, all right, how many of y'all familiar with Boxy? All right, how I feel, y'all? I mean, the cool thing about Boxy is that not only does it play almost anything you throw at it, but it also allows you to, you know, update your Facebook status, you know, pull videos from your Facebook friends. Like the other day, I was like watching some of my, like, watching this, like, crazy video that one of my friends posted on Facebook, and pretty much she was like, <laughs> and, pretty, and I was like, it, it was great to be able to watch it from one application without having to leave and have to open a web browser, go to connect Facebook, and try to just watch the video. And so that's my favorite part about my net talk. Although I do sometimes have to open a web browser to watch the movies that 
I can't stream Drew Boxy, but you know, but you know, as Boxy gets better, I mean, I'm quite sure I won't have to open, try to open a web browser. I mean, you know, Boxy does come with its own Boxy browser, but I do find that it's not complete yet. And one of the things you know about open source software is that sometimes, you know, they don't wait for the software to just be quote unquote mature to release it. They just release it and invite user feedback to make the product better. And so for some people, some people like that approach and other people that just want stuff to work, they may not like it. But that just like, you have two like, different schools to thought. Uh, originally, I had a one terabyte hard drive attached to this net top. I've, I have since you know, removed it and just used it as a backup source. And so now all my media is streamed right from my server, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And one of the reasons I switched, be, switched to a media server is because, number one, I want to be able to access all my media from wherever computer I'm at. And number two, my hard drive, because generally I leave this computer on even though I don't need to. And I noticed that it kind of wore out my one terabyte hard drive. So it's not as, it's not as responsive as it used to be. I mean, even though I did try to do certain things, like do some file system tests and stuff, I may try to reformat, see if that will help. But, but for me, I just found that take, take out the hard drive, free up, free up one of my USB ports, and just run everything off the network. All right, any questions so far? Okay. Now my netbook I actually purchased on like on Thanksgiving Day by a couple by a couple years ago. And I got it from Best Buy when the no net when the netbooks were popular and I paid one seventy nine for it and the and the regular price was two ninety nine. And so I got a good deal on it. This, I mean, and for the long for a long time I was running Windows XP Home on it. But then I said, with my success with my net top and with the success that I'm having with my desktop, I'm gonna try to put links on this netbook as well. And you know, and I went with the netbook edition of Ubuntu. I mean, I guess you can tell that I like Ubuntu, right? But here's the funny thing about, about Ubuntu. When I first, when I used it like a couple years ago, I really didn't like it. I mean, I really found it was too dumbed down for me as a power user. But, but over the years, I'm, I see that Ubuntu has like really matured. Now, I noticed that with Unity, I know there's a lot of controversy with Unity. And I haven't had a chance to try the latest version of Ubuntu but from what I'm seeing, I really don't like that interface. You know, it's one thing to try to improve your interface, but it's a whole nudge to just mess it up. I mean, yeah. I mean, I was watching a, I was watching an arc on Linux Journal, and they were talking about one of the biggest beefs about Unity. It's like they try to be like Mac OS X by having a dock, and try to combine with Windows pinning. And unfortunately, I think they, did, they didn't get it right this time. Hopefully, you know, people will give feedback and they'll improve the interface for the next release. But I mean, one thing is, I do notice about the open source community is that they do listen. They may not agree with you, but they will listen. <laughs> and so with this netbook, I, I didn't wipe out the Windows XP partition you know, I really probably could, I could do it right now if I want to, because I really wasn't as comfortable for some reason to get rid of the Windows XP partition. But here, but the funny thing is, I haven't booted to that Windows XP partition in months, so I'm wondering why why I still got it. <laughs> but you know, for me, I mean, I'm not going. One thing you know, you'll notice about me is that I'm not a 
techy tech guy, you know, they do all the tech jargon. I try to be real people. And I believe that you have to be real people because, because, pe because real people use Linux. I mean, we're trying to get everybody to embrace Linux and not just those that are just tech savvy, right? Mm -hmm. and, so, and so with this, I use this often when I'm traveling. Except if I want to do like watch movies and stuff, then I bring my other laptop, which, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. That is much more beefier than this one. And so with this Ubuntu Lucid Lens netbook, I mean it's, it's an Intel Atom dual core processor. And one one and, and here's the funny thing about this particular this netbook. If I run it in Windows it only detects one core. I run a Linux, it detects two. Why is that? I don't know. But I guess that's another thing that Linux has gotten correct. And so this netbook has one gig of RAM. Can't, it can't really upgra upgrade this particular model because they don't have like one RAM slot and just one gig of RAM. So, all right, I think I'll go back to this net top. I was going to say something. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll go back. It'll come back to me. All right, this laptop was the last machine to actually put Linux on. Um, prior to that, it was running Vista. And with me, this, when, when I first used Vista, actually, I really liked Vista. But then I started seeing it would start getting buggier and start slowing down. Never crashed on me though. Not like Windows XP did. But I did notice that it, Windows Vista was just get to a point where I start up, it'll take about five, 10 minutes just to make, have the desktop usable. I mean, it'll show the desktop within about two, three minutes, but I really couldn't use the computer for another seven, which to me is unacceptable. And for and for me, I did, I did reinstall Vista. So like the first thing I did with this was I did like I did with my, with my net top is I actually created a dual, dual boot system with at that time it was another version of Ubuntu, like Lucian Lens. But later I decided to replace that hard drive, and I replaced that one. It actually had one sixty gig hard drive. I replaced it with a 500 gigabyte hard drive because I want to have that as a second, like media, like media system. Now like, this is a system that I use, like if I'm traveling and I want to watch movies, like if I'm going somewhere. My net, by my netbook, I use if I'm around town, and they need to take care of some business. And so. So this laptop has, right now, has Linux Mint Julia. No, that's version 10. Now I do know that version 11 has come out. I mean, in which I will try, you know, shortly. But right now, if you got something that's working, why, why rush to upgrade it? And that's another thing I like about Linux is you don't have to be forced to upgrade your OS. I mean, you can say where you're at. Although on some distros, you're not going to get the latest updates. But if you but if you focus on, but if you want a stable OS, nobody's going to force you to upgrade. And so for this one, I do do some like my office suite, but I also have a couple of boxes around this system, and I do have some of my movies and my music on there, but I don't put, don't put everything on it because number one, I have half the storage as my one terabyte hard drive, so I can't put everything on there. And number two, I do use it occasionally for business purposes. All right, and my final machine that I've converted over to Linux was this server. Now, let me tell I have a funny story about this particular machine. When I bought this machine off of eBay, 
you know, it had a like motherboard, and it would not accept any type of add-on cards. Like the PCI bus was just corrupt. And I did like BIOS upgrades and stuff, and it just would not work. And so in order to get network, I had to actually buy a USB device. Now fast forward to after I got my desktop, I decided I wanted to revitalize this machine. I want to bring some life to it. But, it, but unfortunately, with the networking issues, with, with the PCI issues, it just wasn't practical. So I, decided I, so I decided to go on Tiger Direct, and I actually purchased a motherboard for it for about 69 bucks. And I actually took, took the chip out of the old one and put in the new one. And that's like the first time I've ever did that. And the funny thing is like the first time I tried to boot the machine up, it would not turn on. And I was like trying to figure out why. Had everything connected properly. I was like looking online trying to see what, why the machine would not turn on. And I looked and I found this one blog post about, about screws. And they said, if you, have, if you have the screw in the wrong place, it will cause the machine not to boot up. And I thought, that was, just, that was just ridiculous. That makes no sense. But I changed the screw. I moved the screw from one area to another area of the mud board. Amazingly, it booted up. <laughs> well, that goes to show you that just because you know a lot about computers doesn't necessarily mean that everything's going to always go ABC. Sometimes you have to do some weird things. And I saw this article that said, explain why this, this is like, why you have to really have your screws in a certain spot on the mud board, but I didn't understand it. All right. So I was able to bring this machine back to life with my two DVD burners. This one, the Ubuntu Lucian Lint Server Edition. At first, I was going to go with Fedora, but the reason I decided not to go with Fedora, because by default, Fedora does install a GUI, and I really didn't, at the time, want to install a GUI, which means I, if I had to, if I saw Fedora, I had to go back and change settings to actually make it work just like just on a command line. And so with Ubuntu Lucid Lens, it, I mean, I had to worry about trying to install a GUI. Because with this machine, I don't have a, I don't have a monitor nor a keyboard hooked up to it. And so when it boots up, it's already set in the box to not check for the keyboard. And so with this machine, I used to SSH, I SSH like across my LAN, and also use this machine to like, do my tunneling, especially when I was at when I was teaching. And you know how you know you go you go to some of these places and they have all these restricted firewalls. I actually used I didn't use that this particular machine. I actually used my other machine, and I will use, I will actually create a SSH tunnel, and I'll just tunnel them all my network traffic like for the stuff that they blocked. I tunnel it through this machine, through my home internet connection, to get by. And the funny thing is, like, my students saw me do it one day and asking me, how do you do it? And over me being a good teacher, I didn't tell them. Except on the last day of school. When they were gone, I tried to explain to them, and they gave me the deer in the headlights look. <laughs> they like, they did not understand at all. But... This machine originally had one gig of RAM. Like with the old mud board, I tried to upgrade the RAM. One of the RAM, that, that RAM, one of the RAM slots was just corrupt. It wouldn't take any more RAM. So with the new mud board, I, was, I bought a four gigabyte RAM stick, used it with that one gig, so right now I have five gigs of RAM. But this machine can also hold up to 16 gigabytes. And that's how you know. What am I going to do with 16 gigabytes? Well, I do do a lot of virtual. I'm trying to, get, trying to learn more about virtualization. And so I, try, so I like to create a lot of virtual machines and run off this machine. 
And so with, so with the virtualization, though, I've, I've, I'm able to utilize all this RAM, and we're going to get some more RAM in a few months to try to max out to 16, so I can have like different VMs running. And so, so I have a two terabyte hard drive. And remember, the, remember that media I was talking about that had on that USB hard drive? That's where it went. And so now I'm using that one terabyte to just as a backup to my media because it only has like maybe 660 gigs of media on it. And so right now I'm just using it as a secondary storage. And I also have it now where I can just take my, my, my USB hard drive and just plug it into my laptop and actually access my media from there when, when I'm on the road. And another thing that I did with that hard drive in the beginning was because I, cause at the time I didn't really trust Windows a couple years ago, trust Linux a couple years ago. And so what I did was I actually loaded the Linux operating system on that hard drive. And I set it to where it could boot from the hard drive. So I went to school one day, I plugged in my hard drive. Of course, into my laptop, at the time my laptop was still running Windows Vista. So I plugged it in. I was able to, you know, turn on my PC. You know, you know, and we were talking about this was the last day of school, so I wouldn't do this like during the regular school year. So I plugged it in, and the kids, when they saw the interface, they're like, "What is this?" I mean, I mean, I mean, if you look in the public schools today, Linux really is not. You don't see it in public schools at all. You do, you do see it more in colleges, but you don't see it in public schools. And you know, here's the funny thing is, in Georgia, where, where I used to teach in, the curriculum actually calls for Microsoft Windows. It actually calls for Microsoft products. It says, in the standard, the students will create presentations with Microsoft PowerPoint. It didn't just say create presentations. And so, and so we really, and so are we doing our kids any justice by trying to teach these kids Microsoft stuff when we should be just teaching them how to use a computer? Because a lot, because if they, and I know Windows is still dominant, but eventually, but you still have companies that just use Linux, and you have companies that use other operating systems, and if you have, they also have like machines that. Like my like cash register, that run their own custom operating system. If if they are, if all they know how to do is run Windows, they they have a hard time adjusting to run those cash registers, run those other running lists, and run all these other operating systems. And so, really, I think in the school system, we need to really push for teaching kids how to use a computer, not just necessarily Microsoft. And so, so I guess you now we're just talking. I'm kind of bringing a bridge, bridge in both topics that was assigned. So it's all good. Okay, let's talk about my lessons learned. What did what did I learn from this? Number one, wind modes still exist, but there are actually fewer now. And those that used to be wind wind modems. Somebody has finally found a way to actually hack the drivers and provide drivers for, for us. But there are a few that you have to have windows no matter what. And I'm thinking about my BlackBerry. Generally, you know, your BlackBerry generally runs on Windows only or maybe on Mac, but with the Berry like, software project, I'm able to connect, sync my BlackBerry using Linux. And so, and so if you don't know what Barry is, I mean, you can talk to me after the conference. I'll tell you more about it. And plus, I also use that software to tether my internet connection when I'm away and not at a Wi-Fi spot. All right, you also have a few proprietary hardware devices that requires Windows just to, to either use it or how to set it up. And I think for the most part, a lot of these like 3G and 4G modems, I know most, some of them require you to use Windows or else they won't work at all. 
And I know like Linksys routers is is a one that like how many of you use Linksys routers? All right. I know the one the one Linksys router that I, that I had it required me to use a Windows installation disk. Now I don't know if it's if it's true or not. I mean. I, I, I mean, do, like for those of you that have Linux installs, do you still have to have Windows to install, or can you install using Linux? I've been able to do the Linux. All right, so you were successful doing it. Okay. And so we just have, we do have like a variety of success with that. But would it, would the average end user, would they be willing to just remote into a, to a, to a to, to the router, or would they just have one just to do set for them? All right. I like wine, but for me, wine just doesn't run every, every single Windows program that's out there. I mean, it can run some. And if you have like Play on Linux or Code Weaver's crossover, crossover program, you can run more. Programs in Linux, but it doesn't. But you still don't have that one percent compatibility. Yeah, I know. Like a lot of my Bible study software that I use, that I used to use, is Windows only. I mean, it will. When I run one, and when I look online for the, for ways to work, get work on the one. I mean, right now there's not way. There's not any way for it to run. Yes. Okay, so what is one? One is uh, is a combat is a compatibility layer for on Linux that allows it to interpret like Microsoft Windows calls. So one kind of list is that link that allows you to run Windows programs without having Windows installed. All right, that's that's a good question. I'm glad you brought that out. All right, and if, you, if anybody else has any questions, I mean, feel free to ask. I mean, I mean, I don't like to do all the talking. I like to have others involved, uh, involvement. And with, in my experience, if you have like certain internet service providers, a lot of times, if you have any problems, the first question they're gonna ask you is, what version of Windows are you running? And if you're running Linux, good luck getting, trying to get help. Although sometimes you can't escalate. All right, go ahead. Um, in my experience, this is uh, improving. Uh, All right, let's, let, me, let me get you on the mic. I mean, we got to, yeah, we got to get you on the mic so we can cut the recording this. All right. So, All right, hold on. Okay. Yeah. So in my experience, this is improving. Um, I look around the room, I see several Macs in the room. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, about five years ago, um, being a Mac admin myself, mm -hmm. technically, um, you know, you, you'd, you'd say to an ISP, um, I'm running a Mac. We don't support Macs. We don't support Macs. Now, it's incredible. I mean, you know, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll help you. We'll, we'll support the Mac. But pretty much, if you know some of the basics on how to troubleshoot networking, how to determine whether or not you have an IP address, how to ping, um, and those are, you know, GUI tools now within Linux now. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of times you don't even really need to even call your ISP. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, but the point is that a lot of that's improving, where they used mm -hmm. to just say, oh, uh, you, you do what now? They don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I do agree with that. I mean, I mean, even with Cox, I mean, I've called Cox several times, and they haven't, like, they really don't even ask you what OS you're running anymore. They just ask you to do these basic troubleshooting steps, and pretty much I was able to, we were able to get things resolved. And usually it, it, it always ended up, turn up, turn out that the, it was their, it was, it was always on their end. But, but if you ask the average user to do that, I mean, would the average end user be able to, like, troubleshoot their network connection on their own? I mean, we want them to, but right now, to me, that's not the reality. And so, I mean, really, the, 
the focus on this talk is more on a novice le level, but I mean, any feedback is welcome. Okay, let's talk about some positives. You notice I have more positives than negatives. One reason is because I believe that it's important that we all remain positive in, in life. All right, stability. I think I talked about this earlier. I talked about my Ubuntu machine run for one year exclusively Ubuntu. I think it might slow down just a little bit, but pretty much it's just, it runs like it did when I first installed it. Simply works. I mean, plug in, I plug in any device. I mean, like plugging this USB device, this USB all right, thumb drive. If you, do, if you plug in a new thumb drive in Windows, it's got to do all this extra stuff, try to install, but with Linux, I plug in like a thousand new thumb drives, it detects the right, it, it doesn't have to do anything extra. And like when I was talking about, I used to own the printer drivers. Plug in a printer in Linux, you ready to print. Of course, you have a network printer, you have to do a little bit more, but just set an IP address, stuff like that, but that's simple. Whereas with Windows, you plug in the printer, you might be able to get the drives on a, if, if it's in the Windows database. Otherwise, you have to pop in the CD, you know, do the installation, and pray that you don't have to install all this extra hardware, I mean software. All right, most Windows software do have a Linux com equivalent. I mean, obviously, obviously, like Microsoft Office equivalent is LibreOffice. Of course, I used to use OpenOffice. Then, you know, when they, when Oracle decided it was uncertain what they were going to do with OpenOffice, I decided I just going to migrate to LibreOffice. And even though my the Lucian Linux this show really at the time didn't have a place for you to install LibreOffice. I was able to search online and find a repository for LibreOffice, so I'm able to run some running LibreOffice even on older versions of Ubuntu. All right, works on old hardware. I remember one time having a having an old server, an old PC that I bought from this computer store. I think I paid 99 bucks for it. And so pretty much, this software had like 256 gigs of RAM. And I was trying to wipe out Windows and install Linux. The funny thing was, I could not get to install Linux. And I did a mem test and found out that one of the memory sticks was bad. But it was running Windows fine, but for some reason it wouldn't install Linux. So I took out that memory, installed Linux, a command line version of Debian, and pretty much it was just good. And, and pretty much that machine had like a 20 gig, gigabyte hard drive, so I would just use it mainly for, for sharing, like sharing a printer, because at the time I didn't have a network printer. I was just using like a printer connected via USB. And so, and so I was sharing that over the network, I didn't want to hook up to my main computer because sometimes I might, sometimes I shut down my main computer down, shut, shut it down, and really, and I think that was that time I was still running Windows on that on one of my main machines, and so I didn't want to have that printer depend upon that machine being up. And with Windows, you have to reboot every so often. I mean, really, have to boot. Really, if you let go more than a day, you really do need to reboot because the performance is just awful. But my Linux desktops, I, I've let, let run over several months and not, have never slowed down. All right, security. I just install Linux and just go. Windows, you, have to, you, you better not put a unpatched version of Windows on the internet, and you better not put version of Windows that don't have antivirus, anti-spyware, and the whole nine yards. And to me, it's like, 
when you're trying to, like, if you don't have your antivirus software on your somewhere stored and you have to go online, those are like the scariest moments. <laughs> because sometimes you don't know, because you can get hacked between connecting to the internet and trying to install the antivirus software. And, you know, I talk about the no performance degradation. Meaning, let me get right there. Meaning that it works pretty much from day one. Like, like my office, like, at, at my at my workplace, we have like a couple Lint servers that we run Oracle on, and you know they still run like they were installed from like like first day they were installed. I mean, there've been some performance you note know, based on the amount of data. Like, yeah, obviously, have, you have more data. Sometimes your queries are slow. And so there's some things we're working on to improve that. But pretty much everything's reliable. Now, now with IHS, I also work on base. And on base, it's almost Windows. So, like, I, so there's only, like, very few Linux servers on Robbins Air Force Base. But, but in... But at IHS, we do use some Linux servers. We don't, we don't, we still use Windows workstations, kind of like most companies. But pretty much sometimes, you know, you just have to deal with, just deal with what you have at work. Of course, at home, you can do whatever you want. Okay. Now, this slide is for new Linux users. What I would recommend to new Linux users. Now you know, in the past, you know, if you want to try Linux, you have to install it, right? Now we got all these live CDs, live like flash drives. They just you can try out Linux before you even install it, and you can see how it works with different hardware before you get to before you commit to one distro. And use the internet message boards for help. I mean, don't be ashamed to ask questions, but do research. And make sure your questions have already been answered before you post a new question. Because I know some people don't like to answer the same question that's already been answered like, elsewhere. I know for me, when I was a teacher, I didn't like my students asking me the same question that I just went over. to show that they weren't paying attention. So... Use the internet, so use your internet message board and and though sometimes you may have to read the manual, even though sometimes the manual could be complex. So so do your homework before you ask questions. All right. Try writing less in a dual boot environment or a virtual machine and see how see how it works as a in a VM. If you like it, then you just you can make you just make transition easier. And don't be afraid to just if you make a big mistake, you can't fix it. Don't be afraid to start over. But of course, make, you want to make sure you keep your data safe. And those, and one of the things I started doing with my later installations of Linux, like on my laptop and on my server, is I've started putting my data on separate partitions. In the beginning, I was, I was doing everything on one big partition. And really, that's not the safest way to go. And the reason for that is, if you have to install Linux, and you have to reformat that par partition, guess what happened to your data? It's gone. Whereas, well, if, if you reinstall, if you put on a separate partition, there's less of a chance of that happening. Like, don't make you lose data, like you have to tell it to format the whole drive. Which does happen. But if you have your data elsewhere, like on a separate hard drive, separate computer, flash drive, CD, DVD, wherever you have, make sure you keep a make sure you keep backups of your data if you really value it. Because we all know Murphy's Law. Anything that can go wrong usually will go wrong. <laughs> all right. Five minutes. 
I think my clock is slow. I was worried about I know who finished early, but at the five minute mark, this is a good time for questions or comments. All right. Okay, go ahead. Which question? Uh, I'll uh, but, uh, Okay, the question was, was, am I, am I still required to maintain a separate Linux partition or maintain Windows in a, at all, right? For me, I, I, I do find myself, when I was teaching the public school system, I did find myself having to run Windows in a VM because a lot of their software just ran only on Windows. But right now, with my employment with IHS, I don't necessarily I don't have to run Windows at all. Even though, like for some of my, some of my games, I do sometimes have to have a Windows partition. So I'm not 100% Linux. I think I like to say I'm like 95% because I rarely play games nowadays because I don't really don't have time because I got because I work. After work, you know, I'm having to spend time with my girlfriend. You know, I have a life. <laughs> I mean, there's more life than just playing games. All right, no question. Okay. Okay. The question was, I'm, I'm, the reason I'm repeating your question because we are recording. So the question was, can I explain, explain my experience with going from a limited Windows you know, environment to an environment in Linux that's like limitless? Was that the question? Yeah. Well, just your, your, your experience going mm -hmm. from a familiar environment to a, an environment that wasn't very familiar at all. Okay. Specifically from a usability standpoint. Okay. And uh, for me, when I was using Windows, you know, I, was, I was a power user on Windows. And for me to switch to Linux, I really had to learn everything all over again. And one of the things that, because, I mean, I really didn't focus too much on my design, my, like, customizing the stuff that was, like, the stuff that was already set for Linux. I didn't do that. I'm not doing that yet, but I will do that. But for me, some things I've realized is, I, I went on my on the message boards. I tried different things, like for like Compass, on it, for example. You know, I installed Compass. You know, being having the rotating cube, having multiple desktops, which in Windows, you know, you don't have that. And I actually find myself in Windows having to download a program to enable multiple desktops. But for me, it was just more like it's just watching videos online, going on going the internet and pretty much just trying different things, experiment, and just keeping back up copy of my settings. So if something went wrong, I could always go back. Did I answer your question or, you sure? Okay, all right. Are there any basic differences between Ubuntu and Kubuntu? Um, mainly you have, well, all right, the question was, are there any difference between Ubuntu and Kubuntu? And generally, the only difference I've seen is that with the kid is using the GNOME desktop or if or the later version of Ubuntu Unity versus KDE. But I do find that GNOME tends to marry the settings. Like when if you make a network setting, setting change in Ubuntu, it generally writes the correct configuration in the background. Because everything in Linux really runs on the command line, just the GUI is just it just runs on top of the actual command line. But with Kubuntu, with KDE, sometimes there's that disconnect. And even, though, and even though KDE looks more like Windows, at the same time, I, in my experience, I find KDE not, not, not as usable 
and, that, and for me, the only area that I didn't find Kitty as usable was in network and wireless networking. All right. Okay. So, did I answer your question? All right. You have a question. YouTube, yes. Um, not I haven't watched Netflix. No, I can't get Netflix to work because one thing you have to realize about Linux is you don't have DRM. You don't have that digital rights management that you have in Windows and now it's coming now in Mac OS. And part of that part of the reason is Linux is meant to be a free system. It's not meant to be one of those systems where you're chained. <laughs> Chained together to and bound by, by bound by different users. Like you know, with DRM, they the the, the producers can limit your rights as to like what you get, what you can and cannot do with that particular media. For instance, they can say you can make one copy of that particular media, or they can say you may not make any copies, or they may say you may watch this video for 24 hours. You know, that's how a lot of the rental systems, systems work, particularly for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox. All right, we have two minutes. Any more questions? All right, questions going once. <laughs> questions, all right, you have a question. I was going to make a comment. I'm a long time user. Mm -hmm. I was amazed when you put your list up there. Yes. Those were a lot of the same operating systems that I went through. Mm-hmm. All right. And for me, I mean, I just used them for 11 years. I mean, I try different distros, and I still do, and I still try to use different distros. I mean, it's not, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm going to stick with Ubuntu for the rest of my life. I mean, that's the beauty with Linux. You can switch to whatever distro you want at the time. And if you want to try different distros, you're doing live CD, you can install in a virtual machine. I mean, the possibilities with Linux are endless. Try doing that with Windows. And Dev can't do that with Mac because Mac ties the OS and the hardware together. All right. Any more questions or comments? Well, here's my, this is my content information. Should be Montario Fletcher at Cox.net, not Fletchy. You know, the funny thing is, on Robins, they do, they do the same thing with my email. They take out my R, and so it's actually material.fletchy at, no, Robins, whatever. So that's my content information, and I'm glad I had the opportunity to share my experience with Linux with you. Hope you guys learned something, and I hope you're able to start using Linux more often.
a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.